Hey everybody, what's up? Welcome to the White Knuckle Podcast, powered by Ozonics. Undetectable, undeniable. Well, hey everybody, welcome back to the White Knuckle Podcast. Today we have installment number three in our series of four on trail cameras. And I have with me my co-host who likely needs no introduction, Todd Pringnitz. Todd, how's it going? Woohoo! It's um it's hot. Real hot down in Iowa. It was beautiful in Wisconsin today. We were uh we we made the move to the Dells, so we did the Dells today and it was uh well there was a lot of people around, but Noah's Ark was fun. So I got a good sunburn. What That's, have you what have you been doing? Um, dude, to be one hundred percent honest with you, all I've really been doing is uh focusing on work related stuff. Um in the whitetail world, I've just been trying to get my food plot stuff uh working. I'm I mean, there's always mowing and that kind of stuff to do. But it's been um so blistering hot down here it's been over 90 every day and the heat index has been over 100 i was actually out uh doing some chainsaw work i've been trying to work out every day so i if i don't do field work then i just do hill climb or something but um i was out chainsaw 105 heat index and like there's no i mean time's running out i can't there's no cold weather in sight so it's pretty much like you just got to go out and just nibble at it but uh, other than that i've kind of left my trail cameras alone um for the most part of the season and um, it's just that time of year where with the temperatures they wear, they are in Iowa. I've seen it before. And when you're up in the 90s, 100 degrees, those big, heavy, mature deer are just not going to move that far from uh, the, the coolness of timber. Uh, even at night, they just don't move that far. And it suppresses their hunger, I think, just like it does in humans as well. Um, and uh, here we've had such a drought that like all the the in interior little creeks and and the little water sources throughout the timber you know and around and and anywhere in the midwest with some deep ravines and stuff usually have creek bottoms that at least have little pools you know here and there and everything was bone dry so uh, we just got a couple inches last week which is going to help all the crops and everything but it's um it's been it's been a, a rough summer in the midwest on farmers and i'm experiencing it i've got a lot of replanting to do i'll put it that way <laughs> Well, it, we've had just the opposite up here in Wisconsin. It's been rain, 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 rain. I mean, I went for um, a ride last night just prior to filming uh, some velvet bucks on uh, some public, and there was water standing in just about every field that water could stand in. Wow. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's just crazy. I think uh, they said uh, it was somewhere in southwest Wisconsin, uh, real southwestern Wisconsin, Grant County had f- somewhere between five and ten. I I don't know. So, a lot of rain. Wow. A lot of rain. Cassville, I want to say, was the town that was absolutely flooded. But uh, well, hey, let's uh, let's get into talking about trail cameras because I've got a bunch of questions. But one thing that I wanted to ask you is, you know, mo- most of the folks that are listening to this likely already have cameras out. And most of the folks that are listening to this, legal or not legal, you know, depending upon what state that they are in, probably have it over corn or mineral. Um, is is that what you do this time of year? Yeah, it's it's. There's no um, there's no denying it. Most guys legally in legal states use um, some some sort of an attractant in the summertime. Um, guys here typically use mineral and or corn. I've been kind of honestly kind of laying off the mineral the last couple of years. Just there's a gray area in Iowa's DNR and rules and regulations. And there's been so many guys who've gotten popped for it that I just don't even, to me, it's not worth it anymore. Um, I would rather run cameras on field edges and listen, I've been hunting this area for five or six years. And my first topic on the list that I was going to talk about was my goals in the summertime in the late summer, throughout the entire season, I'm not, I'm not hunting for photos. My goal is not to accumulate a million pictures of big bucks and, and, and have them to print out and put on my wall. That's not my goal. My goal is locating and killing big mature deer 
So I'm very patient in the summertime. Now, flip the coin 10 years back, Jason, and I was out running around like in, like a madman, just moving cameras around constantly, just trying to get pictures of different bucks, um, trying to locate them. And also, you know, it was kind of early in the days of white knuckle. So I was trying to make sure that we had good trail camera pictures to use and all that stuff. But I've really kind of taken a back seat with it. Now I'm a little bit more patient. Um, and I'm going to just kind of go through like what's on my mind this time of year, moving into the late summer, early fall, et cetera. And then maybe in each one of those categories, if you have any questions or anything like that, we can hit them as they come. Yeah, let, let's do it. I've got a whole bunch of thoughts uh, outside the the whole using mineral because here in Wisconsin, we just can't. And I've switched sure. from private land to public land this year. And, and I guess I've got some observations that I'll I'll share and, and get your two cents on, but, uh, let's hear it. Let's, let's, let's do it. Well, first and foremost, you hit minerals. Okay. Um, I used to run mineral cameras. I all right, a bunch of different minerals and I've let most of them just go. So I've covered some of them up, etc. Um, but most generally they're hitting it for the sodium this time of year. Those same deer, if they're active in those areas this time of year, you're going to be able to get pictures of them later into the summer and going into fall. So just because, and I, if anything, I really, to me, summer velvet pictures are bonus, but a lot of the big bucks that I end up hunting are, are on different farms. They're off in no man's land where they don't need to be anywhere near civilization. So they live in, in their summer ranges, are completely separate from a majority of um, the deer, to be honest with you. Like where the masses are, usually you'll get a buck that'll show up here and there, but they kind of just want to be alone. Uh, and down here, there's so much food. Usually, th they just are, are going to be kind of uh, loners during the summertime. So... Uh, in the summer, I'm just low, low impact. Um, I don't want to put pressure into the t into the different areas that I plan on hunting in the fall. Um, and you don't really need to, man. Uh, unless you're looking for deer in a new area, that's where uh, I'm a little bit more aggressive all the way around. Because if you, okay, let's say your goal is a 130-inch three-year-old. If there isn't a three-year-old on that property, I don't want to waste time hunting it in the fall. So I'd rather be a little bit more aggressive in the summer with cameras and moving them around a little bit. Um, trying to get, you know, the best box. And if you put some pressure on, so be it, but you got to find out what's there. If you really want to have a realistic expectation of killing something. Let, let me just stop you real quick and ask you a quick question. And it's one that I'm dying to know the answer to, or at least get your opinion on. And that is if you don't get a picture of a buck that you know is is likely to be there do you assume that he's not there no i but again it comes with history on in my property in my area um last year for example this walter payton buck that i was hunting this past season he was a giant giant typical and i i got one series of pictures of him in the summertime and he was just in the middle of this field it was a random spot uh, and I, I got, I don't know, he's probably 80 yards away from the camera, but I could see where he was, zoom in and whatnot. And I got three pictures of him in one instance. That was it. Never showed up again until uh, hunting season, like around the rut. And that's just so common. Like, they just don't move that much, man. I mean, there's there's certain farms, certain guys who have the have everything going for them. You know, you can go out and watch big bucks every night in bean fields and stuff. And around here... It's just not as common. There's just too much pressure and, and too many people around. They have other areas that they can be completely left alone, and, and that's where they're going to be. Well, this time of year, again, I, if, you're, if you're in a new area and you're trying to find deer, you got to know what's in the neighborhood. But it, just because you're not getting pictures of big bucks this time of year, don't let that worry you. Um, my property here in Iowa on my 63 acres, I, I run cameras every summer I have for the last six years. And Rich Ball, the guy I bought it from, he told me, he said, don't be disappointed if you're not getting a lot of big buck pictures in the summer. He said, that's been common. And usually about mid-October is when all of a sudden the bucks will start showing up. And primarily here on my farm, I've got a bunch of food. So I have the does. So that's the time of year I'm really worried about having trail camera pictures of bucks is, you know, October going into November, I move all my cameras mostly onto scrapes. I want to have them in situations where with the rut coming into full force, they're going to start working on um, a, a circuit, I call them. And a lot of times they're almost in a circle. But they're going to have social areas that they go from one social area to bedding area maybe to another social area. To, you know, you're basically connecting the dots. So 
in the last several years, my real tactic has started to create these social networking areas so I can kind of manipulate their movements, so to speak, from point A to point B to point C. And let's say, just in an ABC concept, let's say point A is a betting area that is just impenetrable. Or to get in there, you just cause all kinds of havoc. Well, I can't hunt point A, right? So if, if B and C makes sense where he's going to be heading, coming, and are going to, to get on a point, point A or go into it, then... I got to just kind of up the ante and say, all right, well, maybe B is a better option. So I, cre I try to create these. And in each one of these little core areas, I like to have a green food plot, if possible. Not all of them have that. I like it to be really, really close to a doe bedding area, 50 yards, give or take, to 100. And if I can possibly, possibly um, create that whole situation, I want to have one main scrape in that area that he... If he's going to be in the general area, he's almost going to be just, it's going to be too irresistible for him to go check that, see if any does have hit it, uh, see if any bucks are around. It's just, you know, at the right time of year, it, you can really dangle these carrots, but you just got to kind of know how to present them, so to speak. So in many ways, it sounds like it becomes easier later um, to get these pictures uh, by placing, in, in, based on what you're saying, you're, you're you're telling me is to, by placing them in these social areas you, you just um and i think i understand what a social area is uh it would be an area where they're they're all going to congregate so to speak uh or sure. ma mingle um let's call it a, a a bar of sorts um where they all absolutely come to hang out let me ask you a quick question though in, in backing up um, it really doesn't have anything to do with trail cameras, but you said it. And uh, I recently was watching a video uh, by Dan Infault, and he talks about doe bedding areas and buck bedding areas. How is it that you identify a doe bedding area? And then how, how is it that you use a trail camera in and around that area? Um, first and foremost, for a doe bedding area, they are just as, just as random as, um, in different parts of the country as anything here. I'm actually kind of lucky, man. All this timber around here, we have kind of like some beautiful rolling hardwoods and within those hardwoods, there's these different pine thickets and, and there's cedar thickets that are just thicker than heck, but it's all thick timber, but it just creates these little pockets and they look different. They're, um, they're a perfect example of like a doe bedding area. And over the years through hunting around these areas, you start to just notice through traffic, where are the does coming from? Where are they going to? Um, but generally, it's food, food, food. The does are going to be close to the food. Their m maternal instincts say they have to fatten up so that they can have a healthy baby, get bread, and all that stuff. So the does are always going to be easier to find than the bucks. Once you find the does, that's where those big deer are going to be. But um, there's a million different factors involved in that. And sometimes deer aren't bedding in a specific bedding area. They're just bedding in a, in a brushy draw or they're bedding along a Creek, you know, does just like bucks. Some of them like to bed in certain areas and they call that place their home. And it most likely is in a close range of where they were born. And they learn the, the area from their mother, where to be different times of year, what to feed on, uh, how to avoid getting killed essentially. So they have no reason to switch if they haven't been killed. Right. Right. So you would define it as, um, geography more than you're, you know, poking in and you see doe, poking in and around these areas, maybe at, at, uh, um, dusk, uh, and you're seeing does coming out of this area. You just know, um, based sure. on the topography, geography, whatever the case may be, the, 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 um, the makeup, I don't even know what the word is I'm looking for the, you know, well, if you haven't, if you can't get into an area before season, like all these different factors, like once you get out there during shed season and you start shed hunting with some snow on the ground, um, like even if it's early, man, early in the shed season, shed season, I always go out purposely to try to find those doe bedding areas. And, and it's a no brainer. Once you get on those little ridge tops or those knobs, you'll start to just see a, a bunch of beds, you know, two, three group everywhere. Well, that's clearly a doe bedding area. So I found and identified several of those over the years. And then by hunting them, then you start to realize, okay, yeah, that's exactly what it is. But wherever the does are, most of the time, at least at the end of October, that is where those bucks are going to be going. And a uh, good little piece of advice, like my buddy Tyler Tissue, him and I always talk during the rut. And um, and he, we always like drive the point home to each other, really, you know, when, when it gets tough. 
just keep pounding those doe bedding areas. Eventually, you're going to catch up with one of them bucks because they're going to be checking them. Um, but as far as specifically for trail cameras, trying to identify where the doe bedding areas are, trail cameras are a wonderful tool. But you cannot beat foot on the ground, scouting, seeing with your human eyes what signs there. Like you're going to see where the concentration of deer sign is, and then you just got to follow, you know, go in reverse of where they would most likely be bedding, where it's the thickest cover. And does seem to like thick cover a little bit more um, than bucks almost. It seems like bucks always want that visual advantage. Um, they seem to always bed with an area that, you know, where they're going to have a view of the doe bedding area, but also where, where the danger is going to come from. So I don't know if that's consistent or not, but that's kind of what I've observed. It seems like does want to be in the thicker stuff and um, they're always going to usually be in groups and bucks want to be generally a little bit more open where they've got a little bit better view. Okay. So in, in thinking about everything that you're saying here, I'm, I'm trying to uh, relate it back to what it is that I'm trying to accomplish right now with all the different trail cameras I have God, all, spread all over the country now that sure. I'm, I'm, I'm hunting public. And, uh, and one, one thing that just popped into my head is uh, I have a camera in an area uh, that I know is littered with deer, mm -hmm. absolutely littered with deer. Now I can't bait, I can't put mineral out in it, and I haven't, uh, but I put it close to a water source. Well, it just so happens that there's water everywhere this year. Uh, I, I think I've gotten one deer picture in, in two weeks off of my Spartan camera. Um, so, you know, like you said, you, you just, you just may not have it in the right area, uh, at that particular time. Is it, is it accurate to say that, that deer's range or homes will change, uh, through the season? Oh, it, 100%. And that's why, like, you know, it sucks when you got a property that you're monitoring during the summertime and you're not getting pictures of it. But I, over the years, I've seen so many times, my, my own property included, where, uh, like a light switch, man, I mean, on, like, October 25th, 6th, 7th, 8th, around there, usually around a cold front, all of a sudden, bucks just start showing up. And then they take up residence, and they live here for the full month, two months, three months of the rut, uh, because that's where the does are. That's where the food is. Life is good. It's it's the place you want to be. And then immediately following the season, as the testosterone starts to run out, then they start going back to the reclusive self and relocate again. So summertime is great for trying to locate a good buck. But if you haven't seen your big buck yet in velvet, um, you know, it's not the end of the world. I really have learned to become patient over the years because you know what, man? You think about it. If everybody else is monitoring that area and they're not seeing any big deer there, they're probably not going to be hunted as hard this fall. And that could be the farm where everything moves into because it doesn't get hunted. So, so take us through the stages of the year. So we've, we've sort of covered what you do in the summer and that is, um, you know, what you've talked about, if it's, if it's putting it over mineral or water, whatever the case may be, some, some place where there's a social area where, you know, that there's a good, um, possibility that there's going to be deer and, and Bronson sure. Strickland hit that on, on the podcast we just did, uh, a few weeks ago. Um, you know, it's, it's important to get it on those social areas. So that's a summer thing. Um, absolutely. And, and, you know, just to pick it, make it in layman's terms, dude, a social area, an easy, the easiest way to create a social area is in a little opening, find an opening that's near thick cover and make sure there's a scrape there. Deer will generally want to congregate in a more open area where they can chase around, play around, intimidate each other, show off their, you know, prowess to the ladies. Um, and it usually is in like, that's why I love those little green food plots, like a half acre food plot. You can like instantly create a social networking area if you put it in the right spot. Um, you have a big scrape on it. It's like, boom, okay, there's one of my points that I hope to catch him on. And sure enough, you can manipulate those. But the hardest thing is sometimes those points are just too far from the core area of those bucks. And so you, the chances of catching them there during daylight are just so, so minimal. But uh, you'd never know unless you try. But, of course, trail cameras give you that confidence through the season as you watch them and you can kind of establish you know, is the buck I'm after? Is he hitting this routinely? How many daytime pictures am I getting? Or is it all middle of the night? If I just don't get a single daytime picture of a buck throughout the entire season, I will really kind of avoid that area. I won't not haunt it, but 
usually you're going to get daytime pictures in those social areas of a big buck if he's living close by. And those are the ones you can kill. The ones that are the ghost bucks that you're only getting trail camera pictures of at night. It's because their core area is so far away that they never make it there unless they just happen to be, uh, you know, doing their long range recon type thing. And those are the bucks you get one or two pictures of. Those are almost impossible to kill just because they don't live near you. They're, they're coming from a different farm. Okay. Um, you just, let me just interrupt you real quick. Cause you just struck a nerve there. I've got a deer, uh, that I, I get pictures of, uh, in, in it's every three days, three to four days. And I can just about set my watch at 10 to nine. Um, it's getting dark. I'll look across the river. I'll see it's getting dark and uh, I'll be like, Oh, I haven't gotten a picture of him in a few days. And boom, my, my, uh, my camera goes off. And boom, yep. it goes off again. And there'll be eight, nine pictures. Um, and he's a he's he's never going to score a whole lot, but he's a big mature yep. deer. Um, would it be would it be fair to say that that he's bedded close to there, or are you saying that because he's not there in daylight that he's likely bedded a long ways from there? Not saying you can't kill a buck that's not showing up on a camera in daylight, and he may be close to it. It's just. Generally speaking, if if you're getting these bucks on like a three day pattern, four day pattern, what they're doing is their core area that they call home. They're there the whole time, or or maybe one or two different areas, and they'll bet around that core area. But it, it could be very small. It could be just a matter of a one little knob or hundred yards, or it could be you know bigger depending on where you're at. But generally, where you're hunting public land and stuff, it's going to be very 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 small, even a matter of a, a dozen yards. Um, And then they just wait till dark before they move. Now, those bucks are killable. You just have to get really, really tight. The bucks I'm talking about that are generally the circuit bucks where you're only getting pictures of them once every four days, three days, like you're talking about, that's a satellite area they're coming to. Every four days, they're going to, in the pre-rut, going into the rut and and post-rut, they're going to hit those spots just to see if those are in heat. And I think it's also it's a matter of just seeing what other bucks are in the neighborhood. Who who is dominating that area, and is this an area I can come in and potentially get a breed of doe, um, you know, during the rut? And that's where I get a lot of these satellite bucks coming in off my property. Uh, I get pictures of my farm, and they're I know where they live about a mile away, three quarters of a mile away, um, and I get you know three or four half dozen pictures of them a year, th- randomly throughout the rut, and it's all during the middle of the night. So like to set up on my farm to try to kill them on that routine. I just don't even try anymore. Um, my goals are to try to locate where that buck does spend his core area or does spend his core time and focus completely on that and only on that and not try to get lucky. If you just try to get lucky by hunting a random spot, you're just, it's very unlikely you're going to. Okay. So we've got summer checked off the list. It sounds like you transition from the summer pattern of, of mineral water, whatever the case may be to, um, creating a social area in, I'm going to assume that's September. Um, and you're going to make a scrape and try and you're going to key in on those kind of things. Is that kind of where it stops for you or, or does anything change from September say, you know, 15th, most of them have have lost their velvet. Things start to happen. Testosterone changes the way that they think, Take us through well, what 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 goes on and uh, testosterone changes the way all of us think. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but take take us through what what goes through Todd Todd's mind uh, when he's going to make a change or does doesn't he make a change? Um, going into going into the the late of October is when I will take my last inventories generally on trail cameras and. Depending on what I see in those the, the pictures in late October, what deer are on scrapes, that usually determines where I'm going to start my rut. I'm going to go right where that deer is. He'll generally be, he'll stay right around where he's going to be at the beginning of the rut because that's his core area. That's the does know he's there. He's the dominant buck. There's no reason he needs to leave. That's the toughest time to kill him, in my opinion, the first week of November. You either have to be right in their core area because they're generally going to be with a doe um, or that doe bedding area. It, but it, it's it's the toughest time. I very rarely kill a deer during the first week of November. Usually it's either later in November or begin, at the end of uh, October when they're a little bit more uh, feisty. But um, I think the number one thing that has changed my options in the last year is the Spartan cameras. I had 
one of them this past hunting season, and I wanted to do a, a full trial on it before we even talked about sponsorship with them. And I put it in one of my most sensitive areas out in the sanctuary uh, because it's an area I just don't want to go into. So I brought it out there in the middle of October, and I just left it all the way through the hunting season. And I was just able to monitor one scrape. That's the one scrape I needed to monitor, though, for that particular area. Now that I know what it's capable of doing, it's just a great tool to be able to, if nothing else, you're crossing off different potential spots off the list. Because if you're hunting one individual animal, you know, he could be in a number of different areas. So it's a matter of knowing where he's not just as much as knowing where he is. Obviously, you get a big picture of him and he was there, you know, this morning, then this afternoon. And I'm going to want to hunt adjacent to there or someplace where I can imagine where he's going to be going. But uh, these bucks just don't lay down in front of the camera, wait for you to come kill him. I mean, it's just another tool, but it's a really useful tool um, almost as much just in eliminating spots as much as not. You know what I mean? Um, the, the big thing, I think, with trail cameras, you know, I, I've, I've been using them for, in a, a number of ways for very, very many, many years. I've used a bunch of different brands. I've tried them all. The, I can tell you deer can sense a camera. It's just, it is what it is. It is not natural in their environment. Now, depending on the farm you hunt, how much pressure they're under, they'll be far more tolerant. You know, we've seen some pictures from different guys on our team and stuff from over the years, some incredible footage they get. And they use them like second video camera angles and all that. And I've just, I've just never had deer be that comfortable around them where they just want to be in front of them. And that's why people use attractants because you can get great pictures um, because the deer is kind of forced to be there. You know, you have to manipulate them into it. So I have really taken that to heart over the years. But you can, you can use and abuse trail cameras. And sometimes they they do more harm than good, in my opinion, especially when you get the guy who has to check them every three days. Um, you know, over the years, it, it, you just got to let them soak, man. Let them soak two weeks at a time um, and and just leave them alone, first and foremost. Let them do their thing. But there's a couple different things that I've I highlighted. I made a list just like I do any show of, of certain things I want to talk about. Um, you know, the big thing for me is you just got to plan on giving them options in your trail camera setup. What does that mean? Well, if you've got a back corner of a field and you put your camera right on that post where there's a major trail, if if there is no other option than to go right in front of that camera, you probably won't get any big buck pictures on that camera. Bucks hate being forced. You can't force them. They'll just go 20, 30 yards down the fence line, jump 20 feet in the air like nothing, and they'll go a different direction. You're better off almost having two or three openings and then try to cover one of them or two of them with a camera, but giving them options. It seems to take the pressure off that particular spot. It makes them feel a little bit more comfortable moving through, especially at daylight. The spots where they just feel cornered, they just do not react to that very well, and usually they'll just avoid those spots. Um, I always try to give them a 10-yard buffer on any camera. So if there's a trail camera set up, two feet off the trails like my neighbors have them set and the deer literally is walking down the trail and there's a camera within six inches of the freaking trail right at eye level do you would you want to walk past that i mean dude if i see a camera in the woods i don't want to walk past it, even if it's mine you know what i mean like i'm just like you're just as a a hunter predator prey thing it's just odd it sticks out and i i just i don't like it so i always give them 10 yard buffer no matter what i'm doing and, dude, the last couple of years, I just bring a lone wolf stick with me, and I climb up the tree with a stick-and-pick trail camera arm on the side of the tree. You can put that camera up oh, 10 feet, 12 feet, and it just takes it out of their peripheral vision, and it makes a world of difference. They don't even notice them. I, I truly believe that now, but it's just getting it up out of the way where it's no longer a threat. It just seems like where it's right, right at eye level where it's obvious, sometimes that just freaks them out, and they and so you're just not going to get very very many good pictures. I I couldn't I couldn't agree with you more. Since I've you know switched to hunting public land, um, I've had to again every time I go in to set one up. Obviously, for 
safety or not safety reasons but security reasons and i don't want to get those spartan cameras stolen um i'll, I'll bring a lone wolf stick with me and you know i'm i'm six five six four and i can get up quite a way so i'll set that first um you know i'll set that first step relatively high and i i have noticed just like you said especially with this big buck that i i you know i I have that thing. I'm going to say it's at least 12 feet, if not 14 feet in the air, um, just because of where I can get my, my arm. Uh, And he's never once looked at it. And I have never in my life had a trail camera where I've had a mature deer um, not look at that camera. I just don't think that they're used to looking up at it like that. Well, outside of bow hunters, which you, they don't like think of like people in trees and go, man, them freaking bow hunters, you know, right. um, they don't think like that. But it's it's not a natural area of, of of worry about prey. Think about it. How many how many times do freaking coyotes jump out of trees on deer? <laughs> None okay. in, in this now, part I'm of the sure world. I'm sure there's one dude out there and it's probably Kevin Schroeder who's like. Yeah, man, I saw that once. I was shed hunting, and I watched a freaking coyote jump out of a tree on a deer. But anyway, <laughs> um, the truth of the matter is I think it's just instinctual. They're just not worried about things that come from above. In the same way, they're not worried about things that, that are on water. So guys, you know, talk about hunting out of boats and stuff. It's just, it's just not a natural thing. Now, squirrels are always worried about something coming from the sky and attacking them. So if you were into squirrel hunting and you were starting to run cameras, I would highly recommend putting your cameras on the ground. <laughs> I think That's, that tip is going to be priceless. No, I, I just think it's out of sight, out of mind, and it's it just not something that, um, you know, there's it's more common to see a big black structure up in a, uh, up in a tree, you know, as a hawk, an eagle, a freaking owl, um, you know, a black spot on the side of a tree, as opposed to something hanging on the side of a tree. I mean, it's just sometimes I've, I've, I've seen the same camera setups over the years on, at different farms that I've hunted, public land that I've hunted. And some of them you walk up to and you're like, you know, dude, is this person legitly serious? Like, you know, 10 feet from the base of their little ladder stand. And it's just like, you know, oh, man, you're, you're killing yourself, right? So that goes right into one of my other rules. Avoid going in the timber with trail cameras and nowhere near your tree stands. Like, there's spots I have cameras set by my stands, and I'm going to get into that in a minute. But for the most part. I don't want to put a camera anywhere I have to go check it where it's going to intrude on these deer in, in, in any way, shape, or form. And throughout the entire summer, the entire fall, the spots I have cameras are consistent year after year after year, and they're generally in the same. I might tweak them up and down the field edge, whatever, based on, you know, during the season. But I want them to be kind of aware that they're there and that I'm the guy who comes and checks them, and my scent is there. They hear me pull into my truck, my wheeler, whatever. I always keep it running. If anything, I want them to hear me, and that's where I have my cameras, and I do that for, on purpose so that come hunting season, I'm generally hunting for them in the timber. So do I want them all on the field edge? No. So that's where I put my constant human pressure throughout the season, and it's it's almost intentional. I, I literally am, usually have some sort of intent before I do anything in the field, literally. I'm just very analytical. That's just the way it works. So I try to stack them, man. I stack them in the timber because that's where I'm going to kill them generally. And I try to keep them off the field edges because that's usually where they're going to bust me coming and going. So if anything, I'd rather stack them a bit. But you got to avoid the timber if you can. Um, you know, uh, the other part, without sticking Ho- pick, hold, man, on, hold on. Uh, I just need you to clarify. Um, wh- so you're saying keep the cameras out of the timber? Yeah, I don't. I like to have everything on edges where I can drive to them. My ATVs, uh, my wheelers. No, there's different. There's different spots. Like I have cameras along my creek that I, I have had out there for a couple weeks, and I probably won't check them for a couple more weeks. I mean, there's always exceptions to the rule, but I would say 80 to 90 percent of all of my cameras are all adjacent, so I can drive to them, walk to them, or whatever. Um, but if you are going to be walking out in the field, do it in a way that you can take advantage of later on. So let's say let's say there's there's um, let's say that you're going to hunt this 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 finger that comes out in this field. Right. And it's very typical. There's a little ravine that runs down it throughout the summer. Run your trail cameras on one side of that finger and make sure when you walk in to get your pictures, you walk on that same side of the finger over and over and over. Come hunting season. Take a wild guess what side of the finger I would avoid. That one. 
yeah. So that's a very simple way. But everything I do, even if I have to go through the timber, anything, and I do the same thing during hunting season. When I hunt a stand, I imagine I'm laying a scent bomb right as I go through. My next hunt, I'm going to try to take advantage of that scent bomb and push the deer and try to hunt them as I push them. Um, huge tool that has changed the way I use trail cameras um, and has changed how I set trail cameras up are stick and pick. Uh, Jesse Hurley, very good friend of ours. Um, we've been using this, his product for a long time. And this is not a product infomercial. This is the reality of it. I spent years cutting branches, jamming branches behind my cameras, trying to get the right angle, get everything set up perfect. You come back and check them and a squirrel or a raccoon or something had run up the thing and knocked your stick out and your camera's like pointing at the ground, it's tipped over, it's over the side or whatever. Stick and pick just saves time. You can put it on any tree and they have tree mounts or um, post type mounts that you set on the ground. And I, I use the tree mounts 90% of the time, uh, especially around scrapes and stuff like that. But what I've started to do over the years is they have this ground stand and it's, it looks like a, a metal tripod. It's very small. Um, that you stick in the ground, you stand on it, jam at the ground, but your camera sits up off the ground from anywhere from uh, two feet up. You can adjust it all the way up to four or five feet up. And I've shown you this before on my farm, Jason, but generally speaking, all of my ground blind setups are usually the same when in regard to a, a distance. I like to have my fields about 50 yards wide so that that's the narrowest gap between my blind and the field edge. So I'm shooting across that 50 yard, that gap. And I like to put a camera on a stick and pick directly across from my, from my blind, pointing right at my blind, out in the wide open, completely obviously that that's a camera on a stick and pick. And they're forced through there because it's the food. That's where they want to be feeding. That's where they want to be checking on does. And so it's a manipulation that I've, I've worked out, but you can't push them any more than 40 yards from your blind. It seems like most generally, those big bucks, they like to have about a 50, 60 yard, um, about a 50, 60 yard uh, range out, uh, uh, radius around your blind. That's where their comfort level is, it seems like, most of the time. So if you try to encroach them too close, like try to get them to that 30, it ain't going to happen. They just will avoid that spot. They won't go through it. So I like to give them a little bit more space, give them about 40 to 50 yards, and then with that stick and pick right on the opposite side field edge, when they come through that gap, they're going to go around that stick and pick and give it a 10-yard gap, give or take, five yards. They're not going to stand right next to it. They won't. I mean, you might get a picture occasionally here and there of a deer coming and sniffing it, but those big bucks generally just don't want to be around it. They're not going to come out there and pose in front of it. But that's where it can push them just just a little bit closer to your blind. And with a bow, that 10, that 10 yards is the difference between a lot of times killing and not killing that deer because the further you go, the more trouble you're asking for. So I will usually have a trail camera set up that I want to be seen. And that's in both trees and on the ground. And, um, and then I'll have ones that I don't want to be seen. If I have a field edge back corner where there's not a good tree to hunt, well, take a wild guess where I'm going to have a trail camera that's going to be seen. I'm going to make those big bucks kind of want to avoid that spot. I'm not going to freak them out by putting a human dummy there. But just putting a trail camera is just like a subtle nudge. You can kind of nudge them one direction or the other. It works sometimes. It doesn't others. But I'll tell you, I hunt between my trail cameras around my trail cameras, just like I hunt around my blinds, kind of anticipating a buck doing something because that's there. Um, so you can kind of cut certain areas off. I, I'll tell you another story. I had a guy one time uh, hang a tree stand. I'm, I'm not joking you, five feet off my property line. And... Um, there was a big friends crossing coming into one of my fields and he was hunting, being able to hunt and shoot into his property and onto my property. Of course I wouldn't be able to prove it or anything. So I had no other option, but to put a stick and pick and a camera right there, right on that trail. And I wouldn't have done it if he wasn't doing uh, what I consider to be an unethical hunt. Um, but it shut that trail off. I do the same thing on different trails here, if there's different areas I do not want them to go through, or if I have a stand that's just adjacent, and if there's two trails or three trails they can cross, or two two or three fence crossing they can go through, you can move cameras around and use them 
as buffers. So get a couple stick and picks, start playing around with them. You'll see what I mean. But the cool part is you're still getting pictures off them. So it's there scouting for you the entire time. So in essence, you're using the camera to push the deer. Absolutely. It's just like putting a little beak in there that says, hey, I'm not natural here. I'm not going to hurt you, but you probably don't want to come too close either. So last year when we were down for the you know annual team meeting, we you know went for a walk and toured your property, and you told us that, and I thought you were crazy. Um, and then it didn't dawn on me until I watched you shoot, um, I believe it was Tom Petty. Yep. And I, I believe that you had a, a stick and pick and a camera in that field. Yep. And, yep, and he, I had video, I had video footage of him right in front of the blind earlier that season during broad daylight. And that's why I went out there hunting and went after him. Cause I have the, the trail camera video I had of him. Right. So in, okay. Yeah. And that pushed him a little bit, a little bit closer. Sure. Um, close and, enough and, to, to make the shot. You know what it kind of also does, too, is it, it gives them, it distracts them slightly, where, you know, if they're walking through a field and there's, you know, a camera on a stick and pick, and then there's a ground blind, they're going to they're, they're gonna be aware of both presence. And in that case, I shot Tom Petty, I think, at like 24 yards. And so he was pretty darn used to that blind, and he was a little bit more laid back. And that was just because of where that particular camera was in relation to the cover. And it was, it's so in the secure area, it's such a killer spot um, where other field edges that are further out toward the road or whatever, you just, you, you can't expect to get that same, you know, reality. Like I think we've all, we've all watched Ted Miller's videos and I mean, he's captured some of the most incredible whitetail footage with, with trail cameras that I think anybody has in the hunting industry. Um, but the pictures and camera and and areas that he's getting this video, I'm assuming, are very unmolested. The only people they probably ever encounter are, are himself, and um, and you know they grew up in that environment. And we're all trying to create that environment, but you kind of gotta you know <laughs> you gotta scale back your aggressiveness with cameras based on how much pressure is in an area because not there's nothing worse than. Uh, just putting cameras right in their core areas and just spooking them out of there. And the other the other factor, which is so huge for guys who are hunting properties that have other people hunting there and public land. I literally don't even like to run cameras if other guys are hunting there in an area uh, with two exceptions. One, just to monitor their, their movement. But I hate letting anybody know anything. I hate giving any information to anybody else because, you know, as soon as you put a camera on a farm in one spot, they're going to wonder, why does he have a camera there? Is he seeing a big buck right there? Before you know it, you might as well just put a sign that says, hey, here's a picture of the buck I got. Would you like to come try to hunt him across the field for me 50 yards from my stand? And that literally is like the biggest beacon. So sometimes I think you're better off just uh, flying in a little solo or at least being a little more secretive on where you put them. Um, and, and you just got to be creative on public land where you can get pictures and not have other guys find your cameras and, or see them. So just like hunting these deer, sometimes you got to find the spots other humans are first. Yeah. My, my strategy really here thus far has been to get them out early in as many spots as I humanly can. And in the Spartan cameras allowed me to, you know, to monitor, um, you know, things from, I've got one camera that's an hour and 20 minutes away. Uh, it's also, it, it's also in an area that is just got a ton of timber. You'd think you're in Northern Wisconsin. There's just a ton of timber there. So okay. I'm, you know, I'm looking for a needle in a haystack, but really all that I'm trying to do is get a gauge of the density of the deer there. I believe that, uh, you know, there's probably on most of these properties, just by sheer, sheer just by the, the fact, the sheer fact that so many people practice QDM, there's probably going to be a good buck on just about all of these properties. Will I get a picture of them? I, I guess I've resigned myself to thinking, you know, maybe not. And it's not, 
just because I don't get one, I guess I've decided it doesn't mean that I'm not going to hunt there. I uh, went out and velvet filmed last night, and because I was so close to this camera that I had just set up a week prior, I thought, well, I'll go grab it. And I was surprised that I had, you know, 56 pictures of deer. Um, sure. No no big bucks. Um but that's a lot of deer for a public uh, a public area and one that is relatively easy to access and close closer than close uh, to the, I guess a whole lot of people. Um, so uh, if I had to choose between getting I mean okay let's be honest I would love to get a bunch of big velvet bucks on camera on a brand new property uh, but if you're going in a little bit blind I'd really be looking for the the greatest population of deer in general and obviously you're still going to be looking for bucks to try to at least get an idea but man it changes so much come fall the number one thing like going into hunting season is is when you start getting to that October timeline and even beforehand you got to go put your feet on the ground and find where the deer are. Find where all the deer are feeding. Look for those scrapes. Create a scrape. Put them on those field edges. And that's when you start taking an inventory of what deer are there then, the deer that you're going to try to kill. Because it happens in the summer to so many guys. They get a trail camera picture of a giant velvet buck. Come hunting season, they're not getting any pictures, but they just, they're so committed to that buck because they've been thinking about him all summer long. And all they can think about is that big buck and they're going to kill him and they want to kill him. And so they hold out and hold out and hold out and the deer is nowhere near them. They're, you know, he's on a different farm, different area because it's a different time of year. So I would almost rather not get giant bucks on trail cameras in the summer, knowing that I've got all the food and all the does and they'll come in. And I've just seen it time and time and time again here. Um, you know, velvet pictures are great. I get them every year, most of the deer, but I just know. It seems like the biggest box generally kind of lay low throughout most of the year until it gets a little bit closer to the rut. That's the one vulnerability. So let, let's talk about um, a specific buck. Let's go with the base master general from last year. Sure. Um, no one's no one's seen the video and they will soon enough. But uh, without giving away too much of the story, how much did trail cameras play a role in what you did with respect to that deer? Um, and did they play a role? I actually never got a picture of the base master general until about October, mid October. He all of a sudden just showed up like snapping your fingers on my property and I was getting pictures of him everywhere. And like, he was like the old buck with his mouth hanging open and all the pictures where he, I mean, it was the middle of October and he was pretty already, pretty geared up um i didn't recognize him offhand of who he was i had only I, i'd gotten maybe i don't know a couple dozen pictures of him but on my uh my spartan cam that i had out in the sanctuary i got a, a perfect picture of him and i ended up deleting the stupid thing i wish i would have kept it but he was he he went past uh, i had a, a mrs dopey's landmine underneath the scrape and in this little social area and my camera was up in a uh, tree about 20 feet away, about 10 feet, 15 feet up in the tree. And right as he turned to look, the camera went off. So he was looking right at the camera. It was a cool picture of him. And he was headed right up into that bedding area. And it was at 530 in the morning and it, it, like another hour yet before light. And so in my mind, I was like, hmm, I know where he's going. I'm like, dang, that's an hour before light. And I haven't even been out in that area. I mean, like, but that's just how they are. They're very, very secretive. So come October 31st. That was the picture I had in my mind when I went and sat on the adjacent side. Um, I wasn't over the spot right at the camera, but I was probably within 150 yards of it. And I caught him coming right out of that bed, and that's where I killed him. But um, So, yeah, they're significant. But I, I'll tell you, dude, come rot, like November, I'm checking my cameras, but you got to... You still got to be a hunter. Don't hunt cameras um, because you'll get caught just chasing your tail in circles. You know, you get a, you go out and check a camera that's on a food plot, for example, and you get a picture of a buck out there. And I mean, dude, every time I'm out there the next night, just like anybody else, because you just got to try. They never come out. It's like, what the heck? <laughs> it's just, dude, you can chase trail cameras your own. I've gotten to the point now where unless I am just unsure of where a big buck I'm hunting is, because then at that point I don't care because I got to locate them first before you can kill them. 
I'm not just going to sit in a stand and hope he comes wandering by. It doesn't happen like that. So I'll make it happen if I have to. But if I know where he's at, I won't even check my cameras. I'm like, literally, I won't even check him because it doesn't matter. I'm not looking for pictures. If I know he's there, that's all I'm worried about. But like I said, nine times out of 10, 90 percent of my cameras are always on the field that is so that when I'm coming and going out of hunts or coming and going out of hanging tree stands in the late summer or coming and going out of the field doing whatever, try to make it efficient. So you can check a couple cameras on your way out and then that avoids having to come in there on a whole second run. Um, so you got to work smart, but sometimes being patient and not just chasing after these pictures, um, it's the best thing you can do. And it's hard to do sometimes, man, when you know that there's a camera out there that may or may not have the intelligence that you need to go kill this buck. But, uh, getting a trail camera picture of a buck can help, but it's not going to kill the animal. It's still up to you. So just use them as a tool. Don't get too, 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 um, literal and chasing after the pictures and uh, a guy we're going to bring on for our next show tyler tish is a good friend of mine he's one of the best at this of anybody i know uh, specifically in farmland he's been hunting farmland his whole life down here and that guy boy if he gets you on trail camera it's like you're done he's gonna end up killing you like he is just that good but um he's been doing this for so 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 long and we have a lot of the same opinions on things and you know, a lot of it is just guys get too anchored to spots sometimes um, and it anchored to cameras. You just got to set them, forget them a little bit and just learn from what you learn. Each time you get, you'll get your pictures and make sure you use uh, Energizer Lithium so you don't have to be going out there twice a month. Well, I, I think I think that pretty, pretty well sums up, uh, you know, what what you use your cameras for. And, and it's a different perspective than any of the perspectives that we've had thus far you know uh you're you know we all use them as a tool uh bronson strickland talked about how we can use them as a tool to get a good gauge on you know what kind of a deer population there is um and and certainly that's a great idea and and a great tool um and i think what you're saying uh and i'm I'm hearing it again and again is that uh it's a it's a tool it doesn't mean it if you don't get a specific deer or you're getting a specific deer, it doesn't mean you're going to kill them or not going right. to kill one. And uh, people get too wrapped up in that. I, I think a lot of it's just our own. It's our our us ourselves, the right. hunters and the hunting industry have put you know put such a huge thing on it. And I think a big part of the reason, Jason, is it's just it's the ultimate B roll footage slash shot or whatever of uh, being able to show, you know, hey, I got trail camera picture of this buck. It's become kind of a part of everybody's hunting, you know, so to speak. Right. So you you got to have something to show your buddies at deer camp right on your phone. You got to have that trail camera picture. And I don't want to take away from the enjoyment that some people get out of these because I was there many years ago the same way. I got, uh, dude, I loved it. And I know guys now who I think, I swear, um, get more enjoyment out of running trail cameras than they do from hunting them. And so it's to each, to, to each and everybody, it, their own thing, um, go out, have fun. I was very fortunate to do this for so many years now where now I've just kind of scaled back, um, on it because I don't need it as much as, you know, a guy hunting a new piece of property would. Um, but I still enjoy checking my cameras just like everybody. But, um, you know, if that's what you enjoy, go do it. But if your goal is to kill them, you know, be a little bit hesitant in the summer. You're not going to kill him with a camera in the summertime. I can tell you that much. <laughs> well, okay. Again, there are exceptions to every rule, but we're talking legally. <laughs> well, I think that's about it for today. We'll save, uh, we'll save anything else. Uh, when you and I and Tyler get, uh, to talk here on the next show that will air the last Monday of July, which would be a week from tomorrow. Uh, we're recording this, uh, the day before it airs. So, um, any final thoughts, marching orders? Ty? Nope. Just, um, just have fun. And if you are in an area where there's a bunch of other dudes running cameras, um, usually that can be a good indication, but you know, you got to kind of I don't know. Just take it for what it is. Trail cameras help you out a lot, but come come October, when you are not getting the buck on your trail camera, that's when I really start getting aggressive moving around trying to locate one because that's where if you're not getting any nighttime pictures of a buck, even, like there's nothing in that area because you're going to get them on scrapes. They will be moving around. Um, and so, but this time of year, if your property's not currently um, 
giving you the pictures you want. Don't let it kill you yet. It's it's still summertime, and right now, just for example, I think the biggest buck that I've got on camera on my farm is probably a two-year-old. So um, you got to take it as it is. Well, there you have it. Todd's two cents on trail cameras, how he uses them, and how he uses them at different times of the year. I really look forward to the next episode with Tyler when we really dive into how Tyler uses his uh, trail cameras to take some of the big bucks that he's taken over the course of the years um if you follow tyler at all on social media you'll know exactly who i'm talking about uh, because he's taken some slammers uh that said i'll end the show for today uh thanks everyone for listening thanks to ozonics for partnering with us in this endeavor again uh keep listening for that chance to win a prize package valued at well over five, six, seven hundred dollars, depending upon the month, and you could win that prize package. So just listen to each of these podcasts for the directions for winning that prize package, just like Mr. Timothy Hurley did here a few weeks ago. Thanks again to Ozonics for uh, helping Tim out. He uh, had his uh, wife and himself down in Arizona. Tim is a resident of Montana. Uh, but Tim was down in Arizona with his wife. I believe he said she was getting a lung transplant or a double lung transplant, and Ozonics was nice enough to ship the uh, whole prize package down there, which was kind of a highlight during a tough time. So thanks again. Uh, thanks a lot to Ozonics for helping us out with that. And again, keep listening in for your chance to win. With that, I hope you have a great week and uh, I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you would like to be featured on any of our upcoming episodes with your Ozonics story, please get in touch with me at jason at whitenuckleproductions.com. Again, if you have a story uh, and you'd like to share it regarding your Ozonics and an encounter with a buck, a, a buck that you harvested, whatever the case may be, get in touch with me, Jason at whitenuckleproductions.com. With that, I'll end the show today. Before I do that, I'd just like to ask that you go to iTunes, Stitcher, whatever media you use to listen to this podcast and give us a review, please. Uh, that would greatly help us. So that is all that I have for today. Jason out.